giving you the opportunity to be here. We know that you know you've done so much even before you got here. But um, it's important for our viewers to know who exactly you are. So I'll need you to take us through your early years, where you were born, um, what your you know childhood was like, how family life was like for you, all the way until you got to where you are, but as quickly as possible. Thank you so much uh, for the opportunity once again. Um, um, my name is Honorable Said Musa Abdullahi. I'm the first of uh, the children of Justice Musa Abdul, retired of an agency State High Court. Um, I was born in the late 70s, I think, in the 1979. And I had my early education in Niger State, um, mostly in Bida. I finished my primary school in Bida. Um, I attended Government College Bida. And I did a national diploma in business studies before proceeding to the prestigious Amadebello University area. I read BSc Economics um, and I graduated in the year 2005. Now, um, I think my, the opportunity to actually school in ABU, you know, is what exposed me to um, the challenges that we are faced as a country and the possibilities in terms of getting solutions to some of uh, these challenges. I read BSc Economics, like I stated, and uh, after then, I did my mandatory NYC in Kano. I served uh, with Zenith Bank in Kano. Then, unfortunately, because of some of the performances that we had then, the bank retained us, so I was very, very privileged mm. not to have um, gone through the labor, the, the labor market. Yeah, I was immediately retained with the bank. I, I, I always count and I look back to my days in, the, in, in Zenith Bank, and uh, some of the things that we're able to achieve and do today is uh, surely because of the experiences that we had in my banking days. I spent about seven, eight years in the bank, and after then, I left for Ondo Marketing PLC, where I was... Um, a sales manager in charge of five out of 60 in the Northeast. And uh, I left Owandu and joined a construction company in, in Kano, where I became the MD. Now, uh, putting all those things together and uh, looking at the challenges that were faced as a people, particularly in my home state, in my constituency, we took interest in uh, getting involved in politics. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, politics, like you stated uh, in your opening remark, is not a volition to be treated in isolation. It's something that we should all be interested in because it affects every part of our lives. You talk about social amenities, you talk about infrastructure, you talk about everything, our socioeconomic drive. It rests majorly on politics, so it's not evolution to be treated in isolation. Mm -hmm. And um, with that appreciation, we took interest to get involved. I went back home, it was not an easy drive, it's not, never gonna be easy, particularly given our age bracket. Um, I'm about, I'm, I'm the youngest that has been given that opportunity from my federal constituency, and even from my home, a lot of people saw it as somebody being over ambitious, but we knew what we were coming to the table with, I knew the experiences I've garnered, and I said no these experiences must count for our people. So that's how I decided to get involved in politics. We went back home and we did the extraordinary with the kind of campaign that we run. I doubt if there's anyone that's done anything close to that in, in the history of my federal constituency. We were in the oh, hinterlands. We were in the hinterlands. We could feel from the people, you know, it's not about getting um, uh, information. No, we went directly to get this information from the people who feel their pains. You know, you, you go to a village, you see children roaming out, you know, tripping out from houses and what have you, and you look around the, the environment, you, you don't see any educational infrastructure, you don't see any uh, basic health care uh, uh, infrastructure, you don't see uh, 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 pipe bone water, any, any, any pipe bone water available in, in, in such community, you don't see any means of serious uh, uh, sustainable livelihood in such a community. So you could feel firsthand what the problems of these people are. And uh, I think that has formed the basis of some of the things that we have uh, come to uh, do in, in, in the assembly. Uh, so I always look back to say, yeah, my people have done well for me to have, been, to have given me the privilege of being their voice here. It was actually our slogan. I promised I was going to be their voice and they gave us the privilege. They invested their hope and confidence in us. And uh, as they will see, the rest is now history. history. Yeah. Uh, we believe, yeah, we believe we're changing the course of leadership and representation, not just in my constituency, but across the country. We have come of age, the youth have come of age to actually get involved and take over some of these responsibilities. I believe, for one, that leadership 
should be more about responsibility, not about positional uh, uh, privileges. It's over the years we've seen people taking interest in leadership positions, not because they're mindful or they're, they're interested in taking responsibility that comes with, with such a, 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 a position, but because of the positionality and the authority that comes and the uh, uh, spoils that come with, uh, uh, with such a privilege. But now we said no. We should be interested in getting involved so as to be able to change such a course of uh, uh, narrative. And uh, so far, so good. We spent barely one and a half year, but my people could see that what, we, what they're getting now is by far different from what they used to get. Now, you've spoken so much about the opportunities you've been given by your people, and you just, like you were just about to finish that statement, you said, um, you, you know, though you've only spent a year and a half at the Federal House of Representatives, your people are beginning to see. Maybe you should tell us, you know, how responsible you have been to your people since we're talking responsibility. Now, uh, I think um, if one is really, really serious about representing the people and being able to impact on their lives, you must first and foremost be able to establish the needs, the problems and challenges that the people are faced with. Um, if you look at the North, for instance, I am not talking about the micro constituency that I, I represent today. I'm looking at the North as an entity and possibly even the country at, at, at a broader scale. Um, our major challenge today is that people have been made to suffer deprivation in terms of social economic opportunities. Today you go to, you go to the far North, the major problem you see in terms of social challenges is the issue of al -Majrichi. Talk about some of these things that you see today, banditry, you know, kidnapping, uh, uh, Boko Haram, all those things, if you put them together, they all rest on one thing. Over time, we've deprived the people of social opportunities. They have not been educated, they have not had this opportunity to go to school, and uh, if you, once you don't take care of some of those basic needs, you're setting the country, you're prone to have what we're experiencing today. Uh, so the deprivation that the people have suffered it's part of the reason that informed our decision to give and get involved in politics. Then you also look at the issue of economic, economic opportunities. We've not created enough economic opportunities for our people. Some of them have, been, have gotten the privilege of getting to school, but after school, what do they do? They have nothing to do. So you can merely see that the reasons for some of the things that were experienced today is not far-fetched. It's about deprivation that the people have been subjected to over, over the years. Now, what have we been able to do differently? I will tell you some of the proposals that we've come up with. Immediately we got into the um, assembly, the first thing we do is to actually extract the environment and look at the opportunities that, that are available in here. And after doing that, we started aligning some of those opportunities to the problems that our people are faced with. We, we, all, we went all out to establish relationships with ministries, departments, and agencies, because that's very, very key. You can stay in the assembly, make all the noise, but you don't get things done. You have to interface, you have to liaise, you have to relate with people at the executive level. So that, that's the first and most important thing that we have been able to achieve. We have relationship with basically all the MDS that, uh, that, 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 that have mandate to impact on, on the lives of our people. Uh, we, talk, we talk about Ministry of Education, we talk about ministries like agriculture, you talk about ministries like work, because in my state today, one of the key and major problems that we're faced with is the issue of road infrastructure. We have the longest trunk A roads, but with the least attention from uh, the federal government. So what are we here to do differently is to be able to draw the attention of federal government to some of those challenges that our people are faced with. We talk about, I talk about the issue of um, al Majrichi, and what, one of the first things that we did when we came in is to look for like-minded people with similar objective, because it's one of the reasons why I got involved in politics. And so far, so good. In fact, we even got the house to set a day in dedication uh, 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 to, to, to discussing the issues of some of the, uh, of the students. And we're coming up with proposals, you know, some of them are already uh, in the pipeline and some of them were already, um, we've gone far in terms of getting them into to see the light. You know, we're coming up with amendments that will affect uh, those students and this bike expanding the horizon, expanding the opportunities for them to be taking off the streets and uh, uh, getting back uh, to, to, to the schools. You know, and like I said, one of the things that we have done is to be able to provide the ad adequate infrastructure so as to be able to give opportunities to uh, some of these children. Now, today, with where we are, 
if, if you are say, you're saying that these children should be more public street and uh, taken back to the classroom, do we have enough and adequate uh, infrastructure to take care of their needs? We do not have. So what are we doing differently is to be able to attract the attention of federal government in providing some of uh, those uh, necessary infrastructures. Now, another thing we've been able to look at, given the peculiarities of my environment, is the fact that today, in the whole of Niger State, I think Niger State is about the only state in the country today that does not have any institution offering medical sciences. It's a major challenge for our children because when they go out trying to get this um, uh, admission into universities to study um, courses in, in the medical field, it's a major challenge. They don't give them the opportunity. And we have data from, uh, 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 from JAM, from Medical and Data Council of Nigeria supporting our drive to get um, uh, 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 a, a University of Medical Sciences sciences established in my state. Uh, today, uh, the, from the data that we have in, in, from JAM, between 2015 and 2018, over 520,000 Nigerian students applied to read MBBS. Yes. But the system could only accommodate about 19,000. That leaves a huge gap. So we're coming up with a proposal to be in order to be able to close uh, the, yeah. the established gap uh, in the system. Because we should be a country that supports the actualization of the aspir aspiration of our citizenry. We shouldn't be killing their aspiration. You know? So these are some of the things that we're doing differently. And we try to do uh, comparative analysis of what is obtainable in, in, in other climes. If you go to a country like India today, they have more than 470 medical schools. The yearly intake into MBBS is in excess of 60,000. The total medical, uh, medical doctors we have practicing in Nigeria today is now up to 60,000 against a population of 200 million. So it's, it leaves a very, very huge gap that we must deliberately try to, uh, try to close. You know, so these are some of the things that we're coming up with. Then we look at issues of, uh, issues of, of infrastructure. You know, um, I talked about the road infrastructure. Mm -hmm. We're coming up with propositions that we ameliorate some of these, these challenges that our people are faced with. Now we will also look at the issue of agriculture. Of course, we appreciate the effort of go uh, federal government in terms of um, giving agriculture it's deserved, it deserved attention. Uh, if you look at it, Niger State is strategically positioned in terms of agricultural potential. We have the potential, but the main thing is how do you harness those potentials for the benefit of our people and for the benefit of the country at large. These are issues that we have been we are on the front burner, and we hope, given the lifespan, within the lifespan of this administration, we should be able to actualize some of the things that we have set out to achieve. All right, um, Honorable. Sir Edu Abdul, you've um, said so much about what you're doing and what you hope to do. Unfortunately, I'm not here to antagonize you, but I'm here to play the devil's advocate because the youth had so clamored, you know, to be in positions of authority. Now, looking at all the things that you have said, you know, the propositions you've made, the bills that are, you know, currently being passed, I want to take up education. That's the, um, the Almagiri issue. Over the years, and I mean over, over the years, we've heard so much about, you know, these children, how to take them off the streets. We've heard about propositions. We've heard about this action A, action B. Yet, it all ends nowhere. It all comes to naught. Even um, as early as, you know, in the early part of the year, especially when we had the lockdown. The secretary to the government of the Federation, Boss Mustafa, made a clear and call for the removal of these kids from the streets and a need to rehabilitate them. How sure are we as Nigerians that having been given the opportunity to serve as youth in this country, that your own case too will not end up with like all the others, where yes, so many propositions are made, bills are passed, yet nothing comes out of it. Now, this is um, some of the reasons why we decided to get involved in this piece. Yeah, what are you going to do differently? Uh, yeah, that's what I'm uh, talking about. Now, um, we are a government that believes so much in investing in the people. If you look at the programs that the APC-led government have shown out over the past five to six years, you have to appreciate the fact that we're doing something differently in terms of focusing on the people. Is it um, in the, in, from the empowerment perspective? Is it in terms of social investment programs? You just have to appreciate that the government, uh, the uh, APC led government, is doing something differently. Now, another thing that this privilege 
being a young man offers us is that we are likely going to live to see the consequences of our actions and or inactions while, uh, while, while with this uh, privilege that we have been given. I think that's one clear um, departure from where you used to get in. You have people being given privilege and they don't really live to see the consequences of their actions. We're young men, we're just starting. You know, and whatever it is that we're able to put to table today, in terms of actual fact, is going to determine whether or not we will we, 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 uh, we stay long in, in this space. The President Muhammad Buhari led administration is uh, dwelling so much on agriculture so that our dependence on oil is reduced to the barest minimum. What are you as an individual? and as the representative of a constituency doing to improve agriculture, especially bearing in mind that you've also been, you know, opportune to have um, um, functioned in one position or the other in terms of agriculture and to get our youths more involved. The approach to agriculture over the years, I think, has been, has been flawed. You know, from the, is it from the farmers? You know, is it from the whole populace? We see, we don't see the business in agriculture. You know, and that's why we've not been able to get the best from agriculture. Now, even as a people, we do not draw inspiration from our history. If we look at where we're coming from, before the discovery of oil, agriculture was the end thing. Mm -hmm. Agriculture was the source of sustenance for this country. It was the source of livelihood for our people. It gave, it created jobs. You know, it um, was the source of our wealth for our people. All of a sudden, there was an oil discovery, and uh, we now decided to go the easy, easy, easy route. Now, I think we need to revisit where we're coming from. There were lots of people that made serious money from agriculture. Talk of the dentatas of this world. It, agriculture made them. And so we need to draw inspiration from the history of what agriculture was to us as a people before the discovery of oil. And we, it's not even a matter of choice today. It's not a matter of choice. You know, it's something that we must take on to because oil is losing its value day in, day out. Look at what is happening in the developed world. You know, so we must be able to focus on what is more sustainable than oil. And agriculture is it. Today, I've said it over and over. Unemployment in Niger State is a matter of choice. Okay. Yeah. If, Why do you say so? Because agriculture can provide us with but the opportunity to get our people in, employed. Yeah, but I have infrastructure in place for them to go into a and now, that, 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 These are some of the things that we, we're trying to do differently. Uh -huh. so these are some of the things we that we're trying say to say that unemployment is by choice as of today. Well, if we, efforts are still being made to ensure that people get, you know, um, all the incentives they need. To get now, the incentives are already being rolled out. Okay. We talk about, uh, you have ACMIS coming from um, a micro, a nice and micro finance bank, uh, an establishment of the CDN. These are some of the things that have been, a, a platform that have been set out to take care of the, some of the needs of, of the agricultural sector. And like I said, we must approach agriculture from a business mindset perspective. You know, once we do that, you're able to create wealth and you're able to create employment opportunities for our youth. Mm. You know, nothing can be better than being self-reliant. Reliant. Yeah. All right. Um, Honorable Saidu Musa Abdul, you've um, spoken glowingly about your efforts um, at representing your constituency as best as you can. Of course, taking the three or four pronged approach of agriculture, education, infrastructure, and so many things. Let's um, hold on a bit here because it's important. So much has been said by the honorable member, but it's important we also get to see some of this infrastructure that have been put in place, some of his efforts at representing his people properly. And of course, we will get to meet and speak with a few people from his constituency. Let's get to meet this individual, so we'll be right back. Since he became a uh, um, member representing constituency in this uh, domain in Niger State, on the uh, National Assembly, he has been, uh, been doing his utmost best to see that uh, uh, what they call constituency projects uh, have been properly pursued and driven and actualized 
So uh, he has been pushing very hard. You know, so for the period uh, within uh, one year, period of one year that he spent there also, he was able to uh, mobilize and uh, push a lot of uh, projects uh, to his own constituency, uh, which we see and we hear. No, we hear and we see. So we are witness to what uh, he has been contributing. And we feel that, yeah, a uh, sign of uh, gesture. Mm -hmm. We should also give him uh, a title so that they have to prepare him to do more. And also to make others to see and uh, emulate um, his uh, actions. Ever since he came onto the scene, he has raised the bar of representation. I'm not saying that those before him didn't do well. But I think uh, his coming has changed the whole narrative. He's doing very well, and uh, I think he has raised the bar so that whoever is coming uh, will have to, after him, will have to do a lot to at least surpass what he is doing now. He is quite dynamic, like I said. Very good. Musa is young and he's doing very well. So he belongs to the class of those that are performing. When you juxtapose the performance of the various representative Bidag Bakukacha have ever had, Honorable Sahib Musa stands tall. Not because we are privileged to work with him, but because we've been in that community from that time to now and we've been actively involved in political activities over there. And I'm not saying this all alone. When you go back to our own constituency, these are the testimony people are giving as to what he is doing for the constituency. All right, yes, we've gotten proof. And, um, you know, we, we've actually gotten um, the truth about the situation. And um, Honorable um, Saeedu Abdul here has given us um, so much. And his people have actually confirmed it. Now back to our discussion. And I want to talk about your activities in the house. You are a young man, like it or not. Even though you try to dress like someone that's older. <laughs> but like it or not, you're a young man. And I know that, yes, there are quite a few young men and women um, at the National Assembly today. How does it feel, considering the fact that, yes, you're young, but there are quite a lot of some elderly people there? So how does it feel there? How are you able to relate with them and get them to think along your lines? Because you know, you are young, you're more dynamic, you're perhaps more forward looking because this is the um, high tech age. So how easy or otherwise is it? Well, um, I will always look back to my experience uh, in the bank. It gave me the opportunity to appreciate some of these things that you have talked about. In the bank, I was uh, in the marketing unit, business development uh, unit, and um, I could relate with anybody, you know, however high you are, it's all about what I have to offer you. And so that that's more like a confidence boost. That was a confidence booster for me. So coming in here, you know, if you're coming into a new environment, you must be open to learn from the people that are already there. You must be open to relating with people because that's what it, it takes to, to really uh, succeed in this kind of environment. Uh, so coming in, we set tools in quickly, you know, because of the experiences that I talked about, we could interface and relate with anybody. And uh, we, at the risk of sounding proud, I think we were well prepared, we were well informed about some of the things that um, the opportunities are, um, are available in the system. Today, I, I, I have I will have senior colleagues at times coming to me to ask, how are you doing this? You know, so it goes to show how quickly we've been able to settle in and how quickly we were able to um, give them the comfort in terms of being able to relate with them. Like I said, they are a fountain of wisdom. You know, there's so much you can draw from them, and that's what we have been doing. Nation building drive can never be rested on a particular demographic. Uh, demography. No, it must be a mix of both the old and uh, the young generation. I've always clamored for that. You know, one of the things that we don't get here is this opportunity of mentorship. You know, we rarely get that in, in this climb. So it's more like an opportunity for us to um, get mentored by, by the older ones. I will talk about the speaker for one. From outside, 
it was a delight to watch in the plenary. So immediately we came in, we aligned ourselves with him, and uh, so far so good. Uh, every day I learned something from him, and so much for 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 for, for other uh, senior members. You know, every day we're learning from them, and of course we're also sharing some of our own experiences and ideas with them. So a mixture of theirs and ours is is going to be what we make our nation building drive a little a lot um, a lot less uh, uh, stressful you know we have um, our what's it called our slogan you know the nation building is a joint stack in task that's the slogan of uh, Badger's uh, uh, campaign mm -hmm. nation building a joint task so that joint task you know is it, it signals the, the the opportunity for uh, you know, people from different de demographies, people from different political affiliations, you know. It's all about Nigeria. Once we get into the, the assembly, it's all about Nigeria. We don't talk party, we don't talk, you know, it's a mixture of people from diverse backgrounds. So every day you're learning from people, every day they're learning from you, and uh, we're hoping that our experiences together cumulatively we be able to um, uh, make a difference, you know, for the country. Honorable Saidu, Still talking about the youth and not being too young to rule. What are you guys doing um, to promote your constituency, which is the youth constituency? Um, I think the most important aspect of all this is um, for people to get involved. You know, you you can protest, which is a constitutional right. You can you can talk about maladministration. You can talk about a lot of things that are not, that are not being done rightly as far as our nation building drive is concerned. But I think the most important aspect of it is if you have value, particularly as a youth to add to the system, it's very, very important that we get involved. Nobody can do it for us. But not it's everyone more, can get involved at the level which you have. Well, people should be interested in getting involved. It was not an easy adventure for me. I stated it. I'm the youngest that has been given this privilege from my constituency. It didn't happen just like that. It took lots of effort. You need to do the extraordinary, you know, you need but to... But not everyone wants to go into politics. Everybody must go, go into, into politics. politics. Why? Because, because it's, it's about, about us. It affects our lives. Politics is all encompassing. It affects every day, our everyday life. And if we feel the players today are not doing it rightly, and we feel we have what it takes to do it rightly. We can't afford to sit on the, on the fence. We cannot afford to sit on the fence. We must get involved. We're talking about we're craving for more opportunities for the youth. We have a young parliamentarian forum. As a result of the, 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 the NSAS protest that we had, we've engaged some of the critical stakeholders in this country. We've met the, the president, we've met the vice president, we met the speaker, you know. But Nothing can be as important as you getting it done by yourself. It's more about us. It's more about our future. When you talk about the future, the, all, most of these people that you see today are not going to be a part of the, those the future. Nobody knows who is going to die first, but my generation has more stake in the future of this country. So why will we allow it, hand it, hand it over to, to, to people that will not be a part of it? So let people take the interest in getting involved. I was in the private sector, I was doing very, very well. Like I said, I was MD of a construction company, one of the biggest indigenous construction company in the north. But with the realization that my people deserve more than they are getting, with the realization that I will lose the moral ground of condemning the system if I don't get involved, I decided to get involved. It was not an easy decision for me, but a necessary one. We're doing it for ourselves, we're doing it for our children. We critical stakeholders, not just in the future, in the present of this co the country. We're talking about the future of this country. We must be able to govern the country so that we put it on that pedestal that we want, we want it to be. You, nobody will shave your head in your absence. Mm. You have to do it all by yourself. You know, so I'm advo I'm, I've been an advocate of, the way of women and youth getting involved in government. Women, because I feel they are more responsible. They, tend to be more responsible with positional authority than the men folks. And the youth, because we have what it takes. We've come of age to actually take on some of these responsibilities. You don't sit, you know, just complain on, on social media platforms without getting involved. So involvement and participation it's very, is very, what it's, yeah. you're clamoring yeah. for. By the time we crowd out 
more than 75% of, of the aged people that are in the system today. I assure you, in no time we'll begin to see a change in this country. I say this with all sense of responsibility. Hmm. Involvement is what you're clamoring for at this particular point in time. And that brings me to a very controversial question that I want to ask you. The Nigerian legislature has over the years been accused of one of the most highly highest paid legislature around the world. What goes into the National Assembly talking about the Senate and the House of Representatives annually? Nigerians believe can be channeled to better use. Do you agree with this, first of all? Not exactly. I don't. And um, um, from the outside, mm. you can actually look at it from that perspective. But once you're in, you get to appreciate things the more. Okay, now before we get to appreciate things the more, can you tell us what your take home is every month? I, I guess 600 and something thousand. Mm. Yeah. So where are the millions coming from? Well, uh, you have this new, legis uh, but there's no office that does not, does not have a running cost. We have running costs attached to our offices. And uh, I don't think with um, the things, the demands of our offices, that's too much compared to what is even obtainable in other climes. If people need to do their research. The focus, the beam such light more on National Assembly. A senior colleague of the Assembly said it uh, just about um, a month ago, Senator Ali Ndumi, he said it on point blank, that there's so much focus on the, the, the allowances of members of National Assembly. Yes, maybe because we feel you guys are earning too much. We're not earning too much. I'm being paid, I was fairly, I fared better in the private sector than where I am today. I've said it, I was better off before coming in. Your take home monthly is about 600 and something thousand, yeah, yeah. but at the end of it, the emoluments, the allowances run into millions. It doesn't come to me. It's Who does it go to? All, running of the office. How many offices are you running? You, you have a whole lot of things to do, you do research, you don't just go, go to, to, the, to the chambers to, to look at people without, without getting yourself prepared. You research, you travel. This is what those, some of those things are meant for. But isn't there a way to possibly, possibly, I think, I'm what just we asking, should, to probably thin out some of these expenses? What we should be looking at, like my senior colleague said, is to look at the war. Don't treat National Assembly in isolation. Uh, you see, at the point if we are talking about the cost, we Nigeria, if we today, talk about can, we can cost of governance, mm. it's something that affects all. Exactly. A, 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 yeah. So why don't you look at it from a world perspective? No, Not maybe we should. No, maybe Nigerians are of the opinion that we should start from somewhere. As you have also been clamoring, we have to start from somewhere before you know uh, it, it takes over the entirety. And perhaps that's why Nigerians feel that if the National Assembly cannot regulate itself, how come the National Assembly can regulate it's good, even the larger government? It's good that we're having this conversation. And like I state, I, I will maintain my stand that it shouldn't be treated in isolation. Mm -hmm. Let's look at the whole country. If we feel, and of course the way it is, that the cost of governance is overwhelming to the yes. system, let's look at it. There's so many loopholes, there's so many windows. Let's not look at it from an isolated, uh, isolated How perspective. How do you want to plug those loopholes if what seems like loopholes in the National Assembly are not plugged, it's said that there you no look at in, in your own assembly. eyes before you there look at There are no loopholes in the National Assembly. And I challenge Nigerians. They can get information on some of these things. They can rest on free, freedom of information bill to really get information on, 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 on what some of these things are meant for. Mm. I think if we do that, we'll be better informed and equipped on, on, on how to address some of these issues. Okay, so from, I, I, like I said, from the outside, you would think it's new. But when you come in, when you come in and you appreciate the burden and the things that some of those ones are meant to take care of, you begin to know that there's nothing extraordinary about it. Let's even go the extra mile of, of looking at what's, what's obtainable in other climes. Mm -hmm. People sit in their comfort zone to just make projections. Nigerian legislatures are at the highest paid. Do we know what's up? Do you know the allowances that members in the other climes are, pay, are paid? We don't know. And so let's take that extra for effort in knowing before we, 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 we judge. Before we judge. Okay. Well, I, I would have loved to go on with this line of uh, discussion. <laughs> 
But for what, but for fear of you know being seen to be taking sides, I think I'll let it slide. <laughs> yes, I'll let it slide. We're always ready for it. Seriously, mm. I told you I'm just coming in from the outside. You will have that impression, mm. but there's no money to be made in National Assembly. Like like mm. Senator Alin Dume said, mm. nobody has left the Assembly as a rich man. None. Why don't we look at the civil service? Honorable Abdu, I think um, our opinions will certainly differ. Yeah. And I'm sure that a lot of Nigerians watching this program might also have a different well, opinion. Well, I am in, uh, in a but better state in yes, terms of information today. You are today. explaining yourself. Yeah, I, I have it's access to more to infor information today. It. I know what it is, so I can talk about it better. And I agree with you yeah. at this point to let that rest. I know that you know, you're a young man and um, you're a family man. Your being in the National Assembly in the Federal House of Representatives, how has it impacted your family? How much of time do you have for your family? Now, those are some of the issues that I think Nigerians need to appreciate about this burden that has been placed on us. It's sacrifice, really. Uh -huh. It's not a burden, it's sacrifice. It's sacrifice, uh -huh. really, yeah. Yeah, but it comes with lots of burden. Burden in terms of expectations from the people, burden in terms of not having time for yourself, burden in terms of not having time for even your family. You know, so uh, I think we need to appreciate this responsibility from that perspective. Before now, before now, I, I'm always around my family, but the times I spend weeks without even seeing them now. I would even be in Abuja, I leave my house in the morning, I don't come back till late night, trying to, you know, make things happen for my people. So I think we need to appreciate some of these respons responsibilities that come with uh, this uh, privilege. It's really a sacrifice. It's really a sacrifice. And uh, we always come back to assuage our families, talk to our children. And of course, you're, you're giving more responsibility to the mother. You're not being able to be there for, for, your, for your kids. Mm -hmm. you know, so the mother has to take you know, cover up for you. So she's taking more responsibility than, 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 than they expected. Okay. Well, I think it's uh, at this point it's important perhaps we hear from the members of your family. Don't you think so? Because I'm sure that they will have a thing or two to say <laughs> yes, about your absence sure. or presence on the home front yeah. as a result of you know your um, appointment or you know uh, at the National Assembly, so that we know how much it's impacted the family, and we also get to meet a few more members of the family. All right, let's get to meet the family members and perhaps some friends of Honorable Saeed Abdul. Honorable Saeed Musa Abdul is my first son, right from childhood. He has been a very honest, reliable, patient, and courageous person who had led to in lateral decisions that he always consults his colleagues and classmates right from his secondary school days. So he's a very honest person and hardworking. I would like to express my gratitude to Almighty Allah for blessing me with a husband like him. Honestly, he's just one in a million. He's the best thing that ever happened to me. He has a very good heart. By the virtue of his um, job comes with a lot of responsibility. So I try as much as possible to be a supportive wife and understanding wife, to allow him to discharge his responsibilities. My dad is scary. My dad is generous. My dad is loving. He plays with me. <laughs> My dad is nice. He is a generous man. And he's honest. He he, he always make create times time for us when he's busy. Like weekends. He creates times for us. Saturdays. We watch football together. And we ride bicycle together. Around the estate. He is a goal getter and uh, he can operate in a very challenging uh, situation. And one thing that is very visible about his personality is relationship management and cheerful giving. His uh, relationship management skills is exceptional. Uh, his simplicity is second to none. And uh, he is someone that uh, believes that whoever you relate with in this life 
has a value. So I think uh, if Honorable Said Musa Abdu should be fairly appraised by the people he is representing in the night assembly, I think he should be given uh, it should be given a pass mark. Okay, I mean, look at those kids for crying out loud. They don't get to see daddy as regularly as they should. Oh, that's not good enough. Anyway, we hope you will make you know some more time yeah, for them. Sure. Really. It's important sure. that you make time for the family. Sure. Now, as we begin to round off this discussion, Honorable Abdul, um, I know that you have people that you look up to as mentors, people who perhaps are your forebears um, in the drive and the quest to provide for your people. Who are such individuals? Um, one, I'm, I always appreciate the family that I was born into. Um, I came from a family that believes so much in public service, in, uh, from our um, private lives and even in the public space, we believe so much in giving back to the people. So number one, when I talk about role models, you know, I have an uncle, he's late now, um, Mustafa Dengi, late Mustafa Dengi, he, he, he owns a big pharmaceutical company when he was alive. He's uh, my role model, you know, he's done so well in terms of giving back uh, to, to the people. In fact, even from his own uh, business resources, he was exceptional in terms of uh, relationship management. He's always above board, so I raise my head I, anywhere, anytime that he's um, a role model and he actually influences um, the life that I've chosen to live today. Then, of course, um, like I said, I come from a family that believes so much in public service. I have an uncle, he was a minister too, Professor Sheikh Abdullah. You know, he's, uh, he's been an inspiration. You know, his drive for excellence is, um, is second to none. My own dad, the retired judge, was an exceptional one when I'm you talk sure about... That he was mostly, um, you know, responsible for instilling discipline. Yeah, sure. Because I can imagine what uh, it must sure. have been like being uh, sure. the son of uh, the sure. church. Uh, sure. And uh, he's so incorruptible, you know. Right. I, yeah, very caring and loving dad. You know, every day I talk to him like twice or thrice. If he doesn't get your call once, twice, he'll call you. What's Daddy, happening? Daddy, you know, what Honorable Abdul uh, here loves you, you to know, the moon. Uh, I think um, it's, he's, he has retired now, so he's now on turn to uh, make him a lot, a lot happy. Oh. It was everything that a, a child would wish for in terms of um, uh, a father. You know, then uh, I also have an uncle. Um, when you talk about somebody that believes so much in family tie, you know, he's in Bida, he's also a politician. Of, I think I took after him. He's the only politician in the family. Mm -hmm. He believes so much in this family tie. He's like the glue that is keeping our family together. So uh, from the family um, point, I right from my childhood i had inspiration in uh yeah all around me so and um when you talk about politics you know i've read so much about the uh, late sadona of sokoto is uh, so much an inspiration what he was able to achieve in spite of the challenges of their time you know being able to keep the knot together i think he was exceptional you know and um when you talk about recent um, happenings in the political space um i will always uh, single out um let show you you know um he was he was a bridge builder he was um what you could define as a refined politician you know, and um, I also come from a place that we believe so much in the traditional, and we respect so much the tra traditional institution. Growing up, our late Emaya, he was someone that dazzles you. Late Umar Sandandayoko, he was somebody that you look up to, you want to become like, you know, so. And fortunately, even if after, uh, after his passage, you know, um, our current Emaya that took over from him, you know, is also exceptional. It's an OP, oh, oh goodness God. You know, um, it's an OP. I just don't, I, there are no words to really quantify, you know, or describe who he has been since uh, taking over the mantle of uh, uh, his phobia as, you know, is somebody that believes so much in giving back to the people. You know, you, at times you think, you want to believe that he's, is he a politician because of the drive in him. At every point he's talking about the people, he's talking about um, issues that we bring about uh, development to, to his people. So you will see all around me, I have inspirations. Then, um, from my professional leaning, I think uh, Jimovia. I worked with Zenit Bank. You know, Jim was an exceptional leader. Jim 
it's everything you want to see about, about about leadership you know i was a young bank but you could see it if you look at the history of zenith bank a bank that came into being in the 90s 20 years we were already standing tall with the the, the biggest in, in the industry so that's somebody that you you can draw inspiration from and uh, these are some of the people that have kept us going anytime you have challenges you look back and say no this person was able to do it and you draw inspiration from uh, such a people then in the assembly today our speaker our right on our speaker i even told him i think just about two days back that his humility is relationship management skip is something that will always stand him tall amidst um, his, um, his peers you know you know he has been exceptional he keeps in touch with virtually everybody he's uh, highly knowledgeable knowledgeable you know like i stated from in my opening remark from the outside you know he dazzled us in the in the plenary you know coming close to him now i am comfortable to call myself his disciple you know so there's so many inspirations around i've read so much i've read about the likes of amin okano uh, or chief obafemi Awolo you know these are people you know that have made ends meet these are these are people that um you know them the challenges they leap over the challenges and uh they were able to at least uh, surmount make, those challenges yes yes and make yes, yes yes so we have inspirations all around us mm. having spoken about all of those people from whom you derive inspiration what drives you as an individual well, I think um, the fact that I don't settle for anything less than success, whatever I set my mind to doing, I do it, I give it my all, and I ensure that I get the best out of it. Um, a lot of people will look back to, to their banking experience, or even people in the bank now will see it as something that is, that is challenging, you know. But I always look back to those things and say, yes, we were able to uh, make up a, a mark in, 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 with the opportunity that we're given, you know. Um, I don't settle for anything less than a success. Whatever it is that I want to do, I give it my, my, my all, I give it my best. And even on this um, rare privilege, I think these are some of the things that we're bringing to bear. You know, if I feel there is an opportunity in any place, I go all out for it. I reach out to whoever I feel who, who can make it um, happen for me. And uh, that's why you see that I don't sit. And that's why we talk about the family not being able to have much of my time. Even weekends, I'm always out, uh, you know, going to meet people that I feel we make this um, rare privilege exercise after uh, after we will have spent our four years. So um, um, I have this self motivation. I'm self motivated. I don't settle for for less. Yeah, I always go for the best. How do you relax? Um, I watch football a lot. Mm. Yeah, and what club uh, do you support? Real Madrid, of course. Oh yeah, that's, 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 that's <laughs> the number one uh, club in the world. You know, and basically. If we want to relax, we I watch lots of. Um, even though I don't get to do that as um, I used to, yeah, but I try as much as possible to catch up. My son, my ten years old boy, will always uh, give me feedback. Yeah, we've won this, we've done that. You know, he's yeah. taking after yeah, you, yeah, and yeah. he's also taking to Real Madrid. Yeah, yeah, yeah he's a Madrid great. fan. So. Great, yeah, great, yeah, great. yeah. All right, thank you so much, Musa Eid Musa Abdul, for pleasure. having allowed us into your home it's a pleasure. and um, for this concise discussion. It's a pleasure. You're always welcome. Yes, I have been speaking with um, Honorable Saidu Musa Abdul, the member representing Federal um, House of Representatives at the Bida Bako Kacha Federal Constituency. He is a man who has not been too young to rule and um, he's doing his best for his constituency. These are the kind of people that we celebrate and we unveil to you week in, week out on Executive Discuss. Remember, this program only comes to you on the network service of the NTA and all other NTA platforms. Let's do this again same time next week when we'll bring to you another interesting individual. Till then, I remain Ololadi Adini Jadali. Bye-bye.